All right, looks like we're up to uh, chapter 13 of Thomas Pynchon's novel V. Uh, we're about uh, two-thirds of the way through the book, approaching the three-quarter mark. Chapter 13 is another short one. It's subtitled, In Which the Yo-Yo String is Revealed as a State of Mind. Uh, and so now in this chapter for the first time, and it's another whole sick crew chapter, uh, for the first time, Profane and Stencil will meet. And they meet in uh, the two different bars, uh, the Forked U, which is a, a Pinchonian homophone, of course, and also uh, the Rusty Spoon. Um, but what happens at the beginning is that uh, Peg Bodine and Profane are hanging out. And now Profane, uh, since Esther has left uh, to, for Cuba, now uh, Profane is living with Rachel uh, and, and Paola. And then one day uh, they come in late uh, uh, from a night of drinking and then uh, Peg Bodine tries to rape Paula. He follows her back into her bedroom and uh, Profane is out trying to make some coffee and he hears her screaming from the bedroom and he goes in and he grabs him and pulls him, pulls Peg off of uh, Paula. And he says, hey, remember I saved your life once, you owe me. And uh, then Pynchon Pinch, uh, recounts this very funny scene in which where how Peg Bodine and Profane met on board uh, or became friends on, on board a, a, a Navy ship, the, sca the scaffold. And uh, what had happened is that uh, Peg is always just trying to get laid. He represents the same principle that is represented uh, actually in uh, Chinese astrological symbolism generally by the pig. The pig is associated with sexuality, earthiness, the lower elements. And in the great Chinese novel, Journey to the West, which is a large four volume opus, there's a character there. We have a kind of fantastic four uh, there where we have uh, a man who's a, a dragon man. Uh, then we have the, the monk who is leading them. Uh, then another, the monkey, of course, the, the famous character from the Ramayana that has been imported into that text. And then Pigsy, the pig headed man. And the pig headed man is always getting into trouble uh, looking for food. And uh, here, indeed, Pig represents that same principle. Uh, so he's trying to get laid, but on board the ship. So there are no condoms because they're going to put into port soon and get paid. But everybody's running out of things because it's coming close to payday. Uh, they're running out of money. They're running out of cigarettes. They're out of condoms. Uh, and so Pig's friend Hiroshima tells him, uh, uh, hey, have you ever heard of the benefits in R of RNF uh, radiation? And Pig's like, wow, what was that? And he says, uh, all you have to do is stand in front of the, uh, the radio antenna at the top of the mast there, and um, I'll turn it on, and it will temporarily sterilize you. Uh, so meanwhile, um, Profane is up on the mast, hanging uh, from these heights. Uh, heights apparently don't bother Profane, as we'll see in the end of the chapter as well. And he's hanging there painting uh, the mast, but heights uh, terrify Pig Bodine. Naturally, his animal's the pig, which is an earthly animal. Um, and so he's climbing up to get near the radar antenna so Hiroshima can turn it on and zap his nuts. Uh, but as he's going up there, um, what, he smells cook, cooking hamburger. Uh, and what has happened is that Profane has actually stolen some hamburger from the, the, uh, the galley and stowed it up above near the radar antenna. And as uh, the Profane, or as Pig uh, Bodine gets up near it, he smells that it's cooking. And he realizes, oh shit, <laughs> the same thing would happen to my nuts. And so he calls across to uh, Profane, they're about at the same height, uh, to throw him a rope. And he throws him the rope and he puts the hamburger in his cap and throws it down onto uh, Hiroshima and another guy. And he says, you, you saved my life, thank you. So then it flashes back to the rape scene and then Pig goes, you know, you're right. Okay, I owe you one, I, I owe you one code is code. So that's that. And then... Um, so then it gets to, uh, Pynchon focuses on uh, Rachel's relationship with Profane. Now that they're living together, they're having sex again, uh, but Profane absolutely refuses to commit to her. And Rachel's becoming sick of his lack of committal. He won't tell her uh, that he loves her. Uh, she believes that she's in love with him, but he says, I, I'm incapable of loving anyone or anything. I'm a shlemiel. That's just what we do. We bounce around. We don't love anything. We don't care about anything. She's like, I don't believe that. That isn't true. I want you to commit to me. And, the more you try to get uh, Profane to commit, the more you're going to lose him. He's, he, his mind is already elsewhere. He's looking for a way out of this situation as the whole sick crew is disintegrating entropically anyway. And so as he's hanging out at these nightclubs, he bumps into Stencil. 
and he meets Stencil. He's aware of Stencil's existence, knows that he's part of the, peripherally part of the group. And Stencil tells him, well, I'm going to Malta and I have to take Paola with me. And I'd like to have you along just to keep her in check. Um, she basically needs a babysitter. Stencil's uh, too old to concern himself with a 17 year old. And um, she needs a babysitter. Profane doesn't really want to do it. But on the other hand, he wants to get out of the situation uh, with Rachel, where he's going to have to make it put up or shut up at this point. And um, so then uh, Stencil starts telling him about his quest, the, how he's looking for this mysterious woman, this bee woman. And just as now we have seen entropy start to disintegrate the whole sick crew into abortion and suicide, and they're all leaving, so too Stencil's quest is now also beginning to disintegrate because as he talks about V here to profane, we start to realize that V as a signal is disintegrating into noise because he's seeing her everywhere and she can't possibly be everywhere. If she's everywhere, then she can't mean anything in particular. And so he says here, he's, he's talking about, um, he's telling um, profane uh, how once uh, she stole an airplane, an old spad, the kind young Godolphin crashed in. God, what a flight it must have been from La Havre over the Bay of Biscay to somewhere in the back country of Spain. The officer on duty only remembered a fierce, what did he call her, Hussar, who came rushing by in a red field cape glaring out of a glass eye in the shape of a clock, as if I'd been fixed by the evil eye of time itself. Disguise is one of her attributes. In Mallorca, she spent at least a year as an old fisherman who, evenings, would smoke dried seaweed in a pipe and tell the children stories of gun running in the Red Sea. And they're being followed by these bums who are trailing along behind them as they're walking near Central Park. One of the bums goes, Rambo? <laughs> like the bum's going to know that Rambo was a gun runner in, in, uh, in the Middle East after he uh, turned his back on a career as one of the greatest poets of the 19th century. Did she know Rambo as a child? Drift up country at age three or four through that district and its trees festooned gray and scarlet with crucified English corpses, act as lucky mascot to the modests, live in Cairo and take Sir Alistair Wren for a lover when she came of age? Who knows? Stencil would rather depend on the imperfect vision of humans for his history. Somehow government reports, bar graphs, mass movements are too treacherous. Be in Spain, be on Crete, be crippled in Corfu, a partisan in Asia Minor, giving tango lessons in Rotterdam. She had commanded the rain to stop. It had. Dressed in tights adorned with two Chinese dragons, she handed swords, balloons, and colored handkerchiefs to Ugo Medishavoli, a minor magician, for one lustless summer in the Roman Campania, and learning quickly found time to perform a certain magic of her own. For one morning, Metashevoli was found out in a field discussing the shadows of clouds with a sheep. His hair had become white, his mental age roughly five. V had fled. So in other words, she can't possibly be in all of these situations everywhere, all over the planet. So he, his signal is turning into noise and V is disintegrating and scattering. He's losing her. Entropy is moving toward maximum, uh, what's known as thermodynamic equilibrium. Uh, which is when there is no more potential energy in a system between uh, tensions of pairs of op opposites, such as uh, in a difference engine, a steam engine, the tension between hot and cold is what powers the engine. And once it loses that difference, uh, then you've got thermodynamic equilibrium. It's equilibrated. All the particles are intermixed. Hot and cold are just lukewarm. And there's nothing left in terms of the energy to power the system anymore. So both worlds, the world of profane and the whole sick crew, and the world of stencil and his quest to make sense out of history are slowly being claimed by entropy as they both disintegrate, as the signal disintegrates into noise. And then finally, the chapter ends with a very funny scene where they're walking outside of Eigenvalue's office, and he's uh, it's up in an, uh, an office building, uh, a nine-story office building, which is interesting because nine is, of course, the number of the muses. And uh, stencil stops him, and, they, and he says, hey, I need your help. Hold on. And he runs into the building, uh, goes up through the roof, and he says, hey, come up here. And so Profane goes up to the top. He has no idea what Stencil's up to. Uh, and he puts a rope around him and ties it. And Profane, who's not afraid of heights, as we have seen from the earlier uh, episode with him climbing up the mast, agrees, there are nine flights up, uh, to have Stencil lower him over the roof ledge uh, to Eigenvalue's window. And he says, kick it in go in and then just unlock the door for me and I'll meet you inside. So Profane is comically hanging there, uh, you know, sort of horizontal with the pavement 
uh, and then manages to turn his body around so he can crack the window open, shatter the glass with his legs. Then he gets in, uh, and then he lets uh, Stencil in, and they both go into Eigenvalue's office, where the only thing that Stencil is interested in are, of course, the teeth, uh, the false teeth uh, that he believes belong to V at one point, each tooth of which is made of a different precious metal. So he shatters the cabinet in, in which they are displayed, grabs the teeth, and they head out. And uh, Profane doesn't really ask any questions. <laughs> he just sort of blithely accepts things as they come his way. He doesn't even know what stencils roping him into here. Uh, and that's sort of where it ends with them walking drunk in, uh, in Central Park. And uh, then stencil getting ready to tell him another V sto story this time. Uh, chapter 14, which will be set in Paris in 1913, um, which we'll discuss next.